Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Launchpad. I'm your host, Dave Kluge, and today I'm going to be joined with Nate Liss at youtube.com slash Nate Liss and Jesse Reeves of Dynasty Nerds. I know it's best ball season, but we are going to be talking about Dynasty today and helping you try to get an edge by discussing some risers and fallers from this offseason. Do we think Amonra St. Brown is a guy that you should be buying, or was his end of season finish a flash in the pan? How is Devin Singletary supposed to be looked at now that he's got James Cook to deal with? And at the very end of the show, we're going to have a very spicy conversation on 2023 rookie picks. So make sure you stick out through there. You're really going to enjoy this show. So strap in. It is best ball season, but the good thing about Dynasty is that Dynasty runs year round. That's what we're going to talk about today. Some Dynasty risers and fallers throughout this offseason. Jesse. Go ahead and start us off here. Since the NFL season has ended, who is your biggest dynasty riser? Yeah, so there's a lot of different guys I can choose from. I think the dynasty landscape's an interesting thing right now, but I, I'm going to go with Kadarius Tony. And I know a lot of people wince when they hear that name right now. He's not necessarily a fan favorite. You can you can draw a line in the sand, and you could probably split a room on either side of that thing. But for me, he's one of the guys that really stood out in this offseason. The Giants really didn't do anything outside of, you know, hire Brian Dable to come in and revamp that entire offense and everything as the head coach. They didn't really do anything to tell us that Kadarius Toney isn't going to have the opportunity to take another step in that offense. Last year we saw, I know a lot of people like to point to weeks four and five against um, Dallas, that huge game that he had against Dallas. And everybody says it was against a struggling defense and it was really bad. And I'd like to remind everyone that Mike Glennon was throwing him passes and the entire <laughs> offense was just an absolute poop show. So for me, um, he really showcased not only does he have the physical ability, but he's a very, very efficient receiver with the ball in his hands. OK, so he's one of those guys that I'm really, really excited to um, to, to kind of acquire on my dynasty teams. And one of the big reasons why I think he's a riser is because he's so cheap right now. So I really think that you're probably overpaying for the value right now. If you shoot off like a 2023 20, second at the moment, you can probably get him for a little bit less than that. Although that's, that's about what I would accept for him. Um, not that I'm trading him, but just to give you kind of both sides of the, the, the token there. Um, my big one is is because there's not a huge sample size of him necessarily on the field with Galladay, Shepard, um, and everybody else on the field on that Giants offense is I like to look at efficiency metrics. So in yards per route run, I did a huge study for rookie um, rookie wide receivers dating all the way back to, I believe, let me catch... I believe I did it a 10, 12 year sample. Um, I looked at rookies like, you know, Percy Harvin, Hakeem Nix, Brian Hartline, um, all in that 2009 class. And I wanted to see like what, you know, yards per route run these efficiency metrics. What do they look like for wide receivers coming in from year one? And do they have, does that have any fantasy relevance or a signal for where they're going to go? Well, in short, you find that, um, an average yards per route run for a wide receiver in their rookie season in my entire sample is about 1.59. Well, last year, Kadarius Tony exceeded two point, um, excuse me, he exceeded 2.14 yards per route run. Now that's known in my sample to be an elite threshold. Okay. We're talking about wide receivers that come in their rookie season and exceed that threshold are guys like AJ Brown. Terry McLaurin, Debo Samuel, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase. And in just last year alone, Jamar Chase and Kadarius Toney were the only two rookie wide receivers to exceed that efficiency threshold. Um, wide receivers that do pass that mark go on to place in the top five, excuse me, the top 12 at a really, really high rate. So I have wide receivers in that sample that do exceed that average to come in and head a top 12 fantasy season at a 38% clip, top 24 at a 64% clip. And those are really, really good numbers given back, given that I dated all the way back to 2009. That's a guy I'm buying. I laid out a statistical profile for why I think you should probably be buying him. And the fact that he is as cheap as he is, I really think just bodes well for your chances of going in, hitting a home run, add him to your dynasty roster. He's young. He's he's very efficient, and I really think that that offense is going to be a fun one to watch with him in it. Yeah, I mean, his ceiling is literally as high as any other wide receiver uh, in the, or any year two wide receiver. I mean, you can go on and on about all the metrics, but at the end of the day, he's a separator. He gets open. He draws a lot of targets, and he's electric after the catch. I mean, what's not not to like there? So Alex Caruso over at Football Guys, he's been beating the drum for Kadarius Tony all offseason. 
And that's why he's cheap right now, because it was on such a small sample size. But go back and watch those games. I mean, what he did was just electric on the field. So I'm completely with you. I'm trying to get as much Kadarius Tony as I can. Nate, before we get into introductions, same mm. question over to you, though. Uh, who is somebody that you are looking at right now as a significant riser throughout this NFL offseason? You know, I've used this joke before. The, the joke of what it's like to try to dunk after Vince Carter. But really, like, this is really the moment where I'm going to have to try to dunk after Vince Carter. I mean, this is this is quite the moment. Um, I think similar to what Jesse did, when, when we played Dynasty, as people that are Dynasty enthusiasts, one of the funnest parts about playing it is mining these players whose value is just being kind of, you know, not considered. It's way off of the register. They're, you know, low value guys currently. And for me, a guy that despite getting a big contract, going to an offense where he is finally the guy without question, he's still being valued about the wide receiver 42 to the wide receiver 45. And that's Christian Kirk. Um, so when we talk about risers, this is a guy that I think obviously has the potential to finish this year inside the top 15 in target share. And I don't think that that's a crazy statement to make whatsoever. Um, when we look at him as a whole, one second, let me pull this back up. Sorry. When you look at Christian Kirk up to this point in his career, I think part of the reason that people have faded him so hard is because we haven't seen him finish any better than the wide receiver 30. There tends to be a ton of recency bias, but even in the situation that he's coming from, which is the Arizona Cardinals, it feels like it shouldn't actually be better going over and playing uh, in Jacksonville with Trevor Lawrence, but I actually think that it will be considering the fact that he will be the starter. This is a guy that when you look at his advanced metrics, he was number 12 in total route wins. This is a guy that was one of the best separators in the league. This is a guy that works in the slot, which is one of the more valuable positions when we look at guys that are high scores in fantasy football, whether it's Godwin or Keenan Allen or any number of players. So I think that this year at his current price tag, he's a guy that I am definitely targeting um, at, as a whole. Yeah, I mean, I got nothing to argue with there. I think the only thing is, you know, they brought in, first of all, Travis Etienne coming back off the injury after yep. not playing last year. Christian, Christian Kirk there, Evan Ingram. I like all three of these guys at ADP, but you know one of them is going to end up falling short. And I don't know who exactly it's going to be. But like you talked about, Christian Kirk, you know, he's playing that slot role. And Trevor Lawrence, for all of the, you know, problems that he had as a rookie, one thing he was really good at was hitting those intermediate routes, which is what a lot of rookies struggle with. You know, they can hit the edges, they can hit the deep ball, they can hit the short routes. He was hitting the intermediate parts of the field, and that's where Christian Kirk really does his best. So um, I, I'm with you on that one as well. And, and something else, you know, you kind of started it off by hitting around this a little bit, but our true buy, sell, riser, follower, whatever you want to call it, should raise some eyebrows because if everybody is screaming, this guy's a riser, the chances are he's probably going to struggle to live up to that. And if everybody's out on somebody, that's probably somebody you should be going out and buying. So the guys that we're going to talk about right now should make you raise your eyebrows a little bit. And, uh, you know, we should have some fun discussions today. So let's go ahead and get right in. But uh, before that, let me hit some introductions here. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. We are now on episode 37 of the Launchpad, which is now on the Football Guys Network. Uh, you might be listening to this on the Audible stream, but be sure to look up Dave Kluge, Launchpad, Football Guys, whatever you got to do, wherever podcasts can be found. Follow and uh, subscribe to this podcast so you can get this stream once we pull it off the Audible. Last week, I was joined with Adam Koffler and Aaron Larson, and we talked about some redraft sleepers. And today I'm with Nate Liss and Jesse Reeves, and we are going to be talking dynasty, risers, and fallers. And like I said at the beginning of the show, it might be best ball season, it might be redraft season, but you can really use this time to leverage some fun trades, make some offers out there, and still get an edge in your dynasty league. So first of all, let me introduce Nate Liss here, formerly of Breakout Finder. You can now find all of his content over at youtube.com slash Nate Liss. He has been crushing it over there. Nate, let everyone know where they can find you on social media and what you're working on these days. Yeah, um, of course, for those of you guys that don't know who I am, you can find me on Twitter at an outrage Jew. Um, I've been doing a lot of work on YouTube, to be quite honest with you. I found myself a little less on social media nowadays just because I've, I found a true allure to the video creation content side of things that I've been really drawn in, even though it is an immense pain in the rear uh, to try to create these fantastic videos. Um, it's really fulfilling when you finally complete them. And then, of course, just the response from the people that watch them. So you guys can find me primarily on YouTube right now. 
Yeah, we got the pain in the rear coming here from Nate. We already got Dr- Jesse dropping a, a a poop show in New York. So I want to thank both of you cast. guys for you said you I guys are adhering cast, to the so. rules. Yeah, I, I told these guys five bucks per f bomb if they dropped them in the show. So they're going to keep it as PG as possible today. But if you want to feel the you know the, the full explicit version of Jesse and Nate, you can follow both of them on Twitter, YouTube, wherever it may be. But uh, without further ado, Jesse. Over at Dynasty Nerds now, uh, very newly joining the staff. Congratulations. That's an awesome team to be a part Thank of. You. Let everyone know where they can find you. Twitter, YouTube, social media, whatever it may be. Yeah, you guys can find me over on Twitter uh, at Jesse Reeves FF. Horrible takes. Probably not a lot of fantasy <laughs> stuff related anyways. But um, yeah, man, I've uh, I've been around the fantasy industry for a while. I'm pretty much focused right now on a little bit of the background work of the fantasy industry. I know before we got here uh, or before we hit record, we were talking about a lot of the creator side and having good discussion about, you know, where the industry's at. And that's kind of what I'm focused on right now is, um, is kind of elevating the space as a whole. And I hopped on with dynasty nerds because, you know, I'm really excited about their vision. I'm excited to bring kind of my expertise there and, and see if we can take the game that we love and just kind of elevate it a little bit to people that might not be interested in it, you know? And so that's kind of my goal right now. I'm not doing a, a ton of fantasy analysis or writing or anything. I don't have any articles to plug and stuff, but um, I am here. I'm excited to be here, and, and thank you for having me on. Absolutely. And, you know, normally when I'm on this show, I'm the guy with the good setup and the good lighting and everything. You guys are both putting me to shame, so I'm going to have to talk to both of <laughs> you about the technical specs, you know, what cameras you got and whatnot, because you guys are looking crisp on my screen you, right now. Any, right any questions, man? I got you. Let's go ahead and jump right in. Jesse, back to you. You already uh, you know, gave us a great sell on Kadarius Tony. Who's the next guy you want to talk about that you've got as a dynasty riser this offseason? Yeah, so uh, this this guy has been the topic of discussion for months now. He was been he's part of the rookie cycle that just came into the NFL. I have Isaiah Spiller as somebody who's a riser for me. Um, a lot of people are going to point to his workout metrics, a bad combine, everything that happened um in between you know, the, the, the off season and the combine and then the actual draft, but this guy could not have landed in a better position. And, you know, I want to preface this by saying that a lot of the running backs that go early and by early, we mean like second round is, is incredible. The Brees halls, you know, the Kenneth walkers, those guys are, they're, they're almost shoot in for a certified role, but guys like Isaiah Spiller who are drafted in the fourth, a lot of people consider them to be, you know, dart throws for lack of a better term. I think Isaiah Spiller is probably between a dart throw and a sure thing. If there is that tier, if if there isn't, I'm creating it right now because that's where I'm sticking him. Okay. Uh, He doesn't have the greatest workout metrics, you know, from the combine and the off season, but this guy is just an Uber producer at Texas A&M three straight seasons, over a thousand scrimmage yards. He has a receiving uh, pedigree. He's a guy that came in and was able to snag at least uh, 20 receptions in each of his three seasons, his 2019, his, his freshman season. Um, almost 38 receptions, 38 targets that year, 27 targets, 36 targets. He's not, he is not built and nor does he play like your, your sort of elusive running back that you want in fantasy, a guy that you, a Christian McCaffrey and Austin Eckler, which is going to be his counterpart this year. He doesn't have that pedigree, but this guy is a between the tackles runner. Who's probably better than your average between the tackles runner. He's, I, I like to think of him as someone who's a better hybrid role player than anything. I think that he's going to be really, really good between the tackles. He has incredible vision. The guy can run. And again, I'm a statistics guy. I like to look at the data. This guy never had anything below, I think a 45% rushing share at at Texas A&M rushing market share also had a pretty substantial market share of receiving yards there. And he is just a guy that's coming from a pro system. And I think the main case that I can make for him being a riser in general is I don't believe that Austin Eckler is going to just give up touches to another running back, but I do think that the Chargers are looking at a situation where they are going to give Isaiah Spiller a substantial amount of touches. Now, a lot of a lot of Austin Eckler's fantasy, um, let's see, a lot of his fantasy points come from touchdowns. I believe he had 21 last year, over 21, um, something ridiculous like that. I would expect a lot of that red zone work anywhere in between the five and with the Chargers being that efficient of an offense, I would I would venture to say that they're going to give the bigger guy a little bit more of those red zone touches just because he has that great vision. You're going to be able to take a little bit of stress off of Justin Herbert without having to have him throw inside the five, 10 yard. And I honestly think that if we can look back at the Chargers history, the last time they took a running back early was 2015, which was Melvin Gordon. The earliest they've taken a running back since was Joshua Kelly in the fourth round. Joshua Kelly didn't have near the pedigree that Isaiah Spiller has. Isaiah Spiller, if he would have put had any 
any semblance of athleticism in his in his um in his combine and in his training his pro days and everything <clears throat> i'm i'd venture to say that he would have probably been at, at the very least a second round pick and i think that's the hang up right there so for me i'm i don't think he could have landed on a better team i think they're probably looking to have austin eckler be more of what he was with melvin gordon um he was still a very very efficient ppr back he was still top 12 in that respect but they're not going to look to get him those touches inside the five. They're not going to look to get him, um, you know, 30 plus carries, 25 plus carries a game. I think that they're going to bring that down a little bit. So he's more fresh down the, down the stretch in the season. And Isaiah Spiller is a perfectly built back with great vision. And I think that he's going to be one of those guys that can just kind of put it through the tackles and, and get you those touchdowns. So I would expect him to be a big riser come the middle of the season. I think a lot of people are going to see maybe a little bit of that AJ Dillon treatment that we've seen over the past year or so. Yeah, and and that's such a great comp, and that's what I think about all the time because Aaron Jones is wildly efficient in between the tackles and in the red zone, but still they want to give the ball to A.J. Dillon. He's just the bigger right. back. He's better built for that, and you can see the same sort of thing here. And pre-combine, uh, you know, we, we were plugged in back in January, February, March. People were making legitimate claims for Isaiah Spiller to be above Brees Hall yeah. and above Kenneth Walker. I mean, people were putting this guy as their RB1, and then he goes into the combine with a strained abductor puts up awful numbers and then slides down everybody's ranks slides in the draft, but he's still a very, very good running back. So I, I'm with you on all that. And I, I promise I'm not just agreeing because I'm trying to, yeah. you know, gas you guys up here. I love discourse. I love pushing back, but so far you guys have talked about three guys that I am in on as well. So Nate, throw me a guy that you're talking about here. That's a riser. Hopefully I can disagree with this one and push back a little bit. <laughs> I would, I, I would love some disagreement. This is a guy that nobody's putting any respect on his name. I'm going to go with Mac Jones right here. Um, Mac Jones is in a situation I think just doesn't lend itself to give you much sexiness. Can I say that? Can we say that? Am I going to get is that five you bucks? Can say that. Yeah. Okay, 250. 250 for that. All right. You're I'll pushing it. Nate. Back. Yeah. Pushing Sorry, it. man. <laughs> Family show. All right. So, but when you look at Mac Jones, one thing that's really interesting is just how good he was last season versus different coverages. We saw this guy was, you know, number one man coverage throw rate. This was a guy that was. Uh, you know, number four under pressure accuracy rating, great versus the zone, of course, great versus man completion percentage was high. And when I look back at his numbers, it's very comparable. And this is not so surprising that he looks very comparable to Joe Burrow. Now, Joe Burrow this year, if you look at the pass attempts between Burrow this year and Mac Jones this year, very, very similar. The air yards actually favor Mac Jones this year. The deep ball pass attempts actually favor Mac Jones this year. It's just interesting to see that he's so close to a guy that I think is considered widely a top five, top six quarterback. And the difference took place. I realize he's only been in the league a few years, but we see T Higgins selection to pair with him initially. Then we see the Jamar Chase edition and suddenly it's lightning in a bottle. And with Mac Jones, it feels like we could still be a year early on a guy who last year, I believe, finished as the QB 18 overall in fantasy football. But again, if we look at the guys that are around him, Nelson Aguilar, Jacoby Meyer, you know, the Kendrick Bourne, these are all names of players that you wouldn't want around any quarterback in the league. We saw guys like Tom Brady elevate players that I think before they became the players that they are, whether it's a, you know, Welker had done some stuff before, but an Edelman or whomever, they really weren't a household name until they were with Brady. And a lot of people want to cite the fact that Mac Jones may never have the ceiling of volume that we're seeing with a guy like Joe Burrow. But if you go back and look at the history of Tom Brady, Tom Brady started off a bit tepid with pass attempts, and then it was mm. completely unleashed for like a decade. So I can see that coming, but this is a guy that throws it deep, has the accuracy, has shown that he's grown in the league, played some incredibly competitive games last year. And again, he's being valued below Justin Fields. He's being valued below Zach Wilson. Uh, these are, these are two quarterbacks that I would not take over Mac Jones. And I understand the allure of a guy like Justin Fields because of the rushing upside and, and the passing capabilities that we saw in college. But it's hard to believe that anybody thinks that Chicago is doing more for Justin Fields than what New England is willing to do for Mac Jones. And the fact that Mac Jones is, is going off the board at you know the value between these other quarterbacks is just shocking to me. He's a guy that I'm trying to acquire everywhere in Dynasty. He's still very cheap, and this might be the year with a little bit of a turn up of these dials that we see him start to push into that top 12 sort of QB1 range because, again, he was 10 touchdowns less than Joe Burrow, who threw the same amount of pass attempts. He had as many rush attempts, but Joe Burrow had two more rushing touchdowns. So if some of these things start to go the other way, then all of a sudden Mac Jones looks a lot more like a household name. 
Yeah, and I, I had to pull up both of their numbers. You know, I was ready to push back on this one hard with the, probably the same thing you've heard over and over again. You know, he's boring. He doesn't have a ceiling. It's a run first offense. But what you said with the comps to Joe Burrow, that has blown my mind right now. Their intended air yards per pass attempt were almost identical. Passing yardage on the season, identical. Uh, completions, attempts, you name it. I mean, Joe Burrow had some extra yards, and it helps when you got a guy like Jamar Chase ripping off, mm-hmm. you know, 50, 60 yards per, uh, per, per game after the catch. That certainly helps. But now, you know, they, they didn't bring in any huge names, but with Devontae Parker there, with Tyquan Thornton, they've got a little bit of extra firepower now around Mac Jones. So, you know, again, I wanted to push back on you, but now I'm reevaluating my take a little bit and wondering if I'm a little bit too low on Mac Jones. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, part of, oh, go ahead, Jesse. Oh, I was going to say just from even just because this is a dynasty centered show, like it, a lot of the dynasty leagues that we all play in are super flex leagues. And the, the, the fact that you can acquire a guy like this or even a Trevor Lawrence for the price that they're going for right now, like they just hold value way longer. And knowing that, that Mac Jones is probably likely to take another step this year is just, it's more of another reason to go ahead and, and just shell that maybe that one first out or depending on your league, even, you know, if it's, couple 2023 20, seconds in a player or you know something like that like go acquire a mac jones right now because i think that it, it's going to pay dividends just like nate said i think it's yeah, he's going to take made that a next strong step. argument for the ceiling there well, that I, I didn't really see before yeah i mean think about this too and and, and again jamar chase was a very big difference maker obviously yeah. for this offense but and new england has a propensity for absolutely screwing up the wide receiver selections i think they probably did it again this year but when you, when you look at the situation, I'm sure they did. They're essentially a playmaker away from Mac Jones having this, you know, this one-to-one situation comparison. So I just really hope that, and again, in Dynasty, it's better to be a year ahead. A lot of people that play Dynasty are the types that would rather pay sticker value or more to see the product validated. I'm the type of player that wants to buy them early because I never pay sticker price. Yeah, no, I, I like that. And maybe it's Janu. Maybe they already got the guy in the roster. Maybe they finally unlock Janu this yeah, year and, and turn him into that yak guy. Doubtful, but we we can be hopeful, right? I mean, I'm I think I'm sitting at 60% exposure on Janu Smith right now and, <laughs> and not feeling too good about that. Jesse, you got anything else to add to Mac Jones? Because that was a that was a heck of an argument there, Nate. Yeah, no, I I like it personally. I'm probably gonna have to go shoot some offers out for Mac Jones now because I I totally agree. I'm with you, Nate. Thanks, man. All right. Well, Jesse, let, let's talk about the next guy then. We each got one more riser we want to talk about here. Who's the next guy that you want to talk about? Yeah. So I know you mentioned raising some eyebrows here, and I really hope that this one does because I'm I'm personally excited about him. My, my guy who's a riser right now, and, and I know some people will agree, but a lot of people are just going to scream into the abyss about the age cliff and everything. But Alan Robinson is a guy that I'm probably fielding a couple offers for, and he's He's somebody that I'm trying to acquire on, especially contending teams right now. Um, Look, he's going to a brand new team. He's coming off the worst year of of his entire life pretty much right now in terms of statistics, metrics and everything. Um, But he's he's 28 years old, which is which is actually pretty much the same age as Cooper Cup, surprisingly. And Allen Robinson has played, what, two, three more seasons than Cooper Cup as well, which is yeah, three more seasons than him, which is I just learned that, which is pretty baffling to me. but with that being said, I think he could not have gone to a better team for his play style and for his fantasy production. We're talking about Matthew Stafford is coming off just an absolute whopper of a year where he threw the most patches, passes, pass attempts of his career. Um, I think if we look at his statistics, I mean, ninth in deep ball attempts, pass attempts, he was eighth in red zone attempts, 116 red zone attempts. The, that offense was just extremely efficient in getting into the red zone. Now, he did have a couple games where we were just like, oh, that's that's Matthew Safford. OK, I get it. But all everything that we see from the quarterback position and McVay's scheme would suggest that Allen Robinson is going to be very, very good in 2022 and beyond. Now, I know that this one in particular might be more centered around contending teams. But I do think that there is a layer to which we can look at Allen Robinson objectively and say, this guy has a shot to be a factor in this offense for the duration of his of his contract, right? And he signed, I can't remember off the top of my head, was it two or three years? It was three, right? Three. I yep. think, and in Dynasty, we tend to look at things, I think we, we get a little bit of redraft brain sometimes when we make trades and we look for the immediate impact, which he's going to have immediate impact, but... I think we forget that these these age windows for wide receivers, number one, are are longer than the running back position. Um, and in that, I think for the duration of his contract, I think he's a pretty solid bet for you to come in there and have strong at the very least fringe wide receiver two. And maybe even if he has, you know, a good enough sample size, excuse me, not sample size, a good enough um 
target share in that offense, which I'd like to mention Robert Woods through those nine games had, I think, 21.5% target share, regardless of Cooper Cup absolutely going insane. There's more than enough volume for Allen Robinson to come in, have a good amount of that target share, and probably sit comfortably in that wide receiver two land. And I am more than willing at his price range right now to pay for that on my contending dynasty teams to really make that transition and go and shoot for a championship. So that's kind of a guy that's rising for me. I know a lot of people might disagree with the age cliff and everything. Dude's only 28. He's got a lot left in the tank. And I, I, I'm, I'm more than willing to just push that bad season aside. He's on a very efficient offense. And I think he's going to be a huge factor this year, especially for contenders. Yeah, and Allen Robinson is a guy that I think that you just have to kind of look beyond the numbers a little bit and look at the situation that he was in last year in Chicago. Um, just so you know, Jesse, I'm fully on board with this. I just published an article about a week ago, like 2,500 words on why you should go out and buy Allen Robinson. I've buy got him, him as man. a top 12 receiver in redraft this year. But right. from a dynasty standpoint, I'm with you as well. You talked about the Robert Woods target share, 21.5%. But he was also a wide receiver one. He was the wide receiver 12 in scoring when he tore his ACL. And that was well. Cooper Cup was the overall wide receiver one. There is more than enough for two yes. guys here. And then even when OBJ came in midseason after being written off as completely dead, nobody said he had anything left in the tank. It took him a couple of weeks to get up to speed. But he was putting up middling wide receiver two numbers on the back half of the season as well once he once right. he got there. So I'm completely with you. Um, and, and like I said, you know, looking behind beyond the numbers a little bit. The writing was on the wall, and I was talking about this last August. Um, during camp, Justin Fields and Allen Robinson got no reps together at all. And, you know, there was a contract issue, so Allen Robinson was showing up to practices late, leaving early, wasn't putting in any time with Justin Fields. But he had a pretty strong rapport built with Andy Dalton. And week one, when Allen Robinson was healthy, 28% target share, 11 targets. He was his normal target hog self. And then week two, same thing. He came out, drew three targets on the first drive. Andy Dalton tweaked his ankle. Justin Fields came in. And then Justin Fields, who had a pre-established rapport with Darnell Mooney, started hyper-focusing Darnell Mooney. And Allen Robinson's target share plummeted. He checked out. He phoned in the rest of the season. Then he got hurt. And it just all kind of spiraled from there. But this is a new season where we've been waiting for, what, seven years now. Just saying, like, what would it be like if Allen Robinson <laughs> had a good quarterback? And now he has a good quarterback. He's with the reigning Super Bowl champs future Hall of Famer is his quarterback. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think a career year is something you can say because he already put up yeah. 1,414. It's going to be pretty tough to, to to post those numbers. But, uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely rebounding this year. And, and I like him for the next three years in Los Angeles. Yeah, and for anybody still asking the question, what it, what would it look like if Allen Robinson had a good quarterback? I mean, just look at Odell Beckham and Robert Woods from last year, as well as Cooper Cup. I mean, there's just no argument to not go out and send some offers to the, the Allen Robinson manager in your leagues and try and acquire him, especially if you are a contender. I really think he's one of those pieces that midseason are going to push you over the edge. And if you're if if you're holding him right now, like I am on a complete rebuild. I have refused to trade him for anything less than a first. I don't care if I'm being bullish. I'm going to do it mid season. I'm going to trade him for a first because somebody is going to come crawling for him when he's scoring 14 fantasy points per game every single week. And he's just, I, I'm, I refuse to sell him right now for what he's going for, but I am buying him for what he's going for. 10 out of 10 times. Yep, You got to have some conviction in your takes. And if exactly. you think that he's going to pop, wait until a few weeks into the season when he shows that he can do it in Los yep. Angeles and then trade him. I'm, I'm exactly. completely with you there. Nate, I see you nodding quite a bit. Do you have anything you wanted to add on Allen Robinson just, or do you want to talk about your next guy? I'm just like nodding in agreement. No, I totally agree. I think what gets lost in the minutia of these, of these rosters, a lot of dynasty rosters have... You know, these precocious young talents that we don't know when they're necessarily going to break out or we're kind of waiting on the breakout. Guys like Allen Robinson are exactly the players you want to own. They come in at low cost. They're going to produce. He's obviously in a great offense with a great opportunity. And you can ride him into the sunset if you want. I'm more on Jesse's line of this. If, if I find myself as not being a contender and I'm kind of forward thinking, looking at my team, realizing it's not going to be that great, knowing that 2023 may or may not be great, foreshadowing uh i i would be willing to trade Allen robinson for picks into the future if that meant that it would help me rebuild towards the next year but he's clearly a guy that makes you competitive immediately and he's fluid in terms of trade value so i love it no i love Allen robinson yep well we are all in agreement on that one so uh go out and get you some Allen robinson if you don't already have him on your rosters nate last guy we want to talk about and then we're going to yeah. start talking about the guys that we are not feeling so hot about who's your last riser that you want to mention Man, there are so many guys I could have picked. Um, probably like Jesse too. Like I'm looking through players that I'm considering, guys that I've considered in the offseason. 
And it's like, man, that guy's too obvious. That guy's not obvious enough. This is a guy that I think is right in the middle ground. And I'm all about putting the bands back together. And I'm talking about Marquise Brown going to Arizona to play with Kyler Murray. Look, I, I like Lamar Jackson. I think Lamar Jackson's clearly a talented passer. They allowed Lamar Jackson the opportunity to air it out. Not as much as we're going to see here in a minute with Kyler Murray. But I think we finally saw this all unlocked last season with Marquise Brown in Baltimore. This was a guy that finished with over 1,500 air yards. This was in 16 games, 145 targets, um, over 1,000 receiving yards. But some meat was left on the bone when we look at Lamar Jackson and we look at this Baltimore offense versus what's going to happen in Arizona. Whether people know this or don't know this because the saga that seems to be sort of coming and going with Kyler Murray, Kyler Murray is an absolute elite passer when it comes to the big money throws, where it matters, downfield. This is a guy that um, last season was number eight in total deep ball pass attempts, number one in money throws, number nine in pressure throws. This is a guy that checks every box, number one in deep ball completion percentage, number one in true completion percentage. I mean, there's not a marker that he didn't check in terms of passing capability. And now you put two guys with rapport back together and you put Marquise Brown with probably – the best quarterback in the league that he could have gone to in terms of a chemistry that's pre-built and a design to his passing game that fits perfectly with what we have been hoping to see from Marquise Brown all along. Um, at his current cost, when you look at guys that are in his range of value, I know this is where the debate begins, right? You've got Rashad Bateman. I think some people feel like Bateman's going to be a great buy. He's essentially taking over the opportunity that was probably left behind by Marquise Brown. Chris Godwin's in this range. Uh, Jerry Judy's in this range. Devonta Freeman. But for me, knowing that we're going to not see DeAndre Hopkins for a good part of the early half of the season, we also know that Hopkins is older. This team has completely whiffed on all wide receivers that they've drafted around him, whether it's uh, Isabella, whether it's Space and Rondell Moore. We haven't seen him do anything just yet. So Marquise Brown is clearly the guy. And we keep hearing that they want to get this contract extension done with him. And I think it will happen. And again, going back to last season, Marquise Brown was already a guy that finished wide receiver 22, wide receiver 21, but a lot of meat was left on the bone with Lamar Jackson. I think we're going to see touched on with Kyler Murray this year. And I think very confidently he's a top 15 guy going into next season. Yeah. And, and I've got him there in redraft as well. Um, you know, I, I, I'm one of the guys that's a little bit more bullish on, on, uh, Hollywood Brown in redraft for pretty much every single thing that you mentioned. Um, I think one of the problems, and this has happened in two consecutive seasons now, is that Kyler Murray has gotten hurt down the stretch yep. and finished the season a little bit cold, and that's what people remember best. I mean, people remember the last thing that they saw. I say this all the time, but leverage recency bias and use that to, to, to you know help your team out, get these guys that got injured late in the season. And this is the what third straight season now where we are going into the offseason. People have lower expectations for Kyler Murray and for the Arizona Cardinals, but especially with this DeAndre Hopkins suspension, he is going to be the week one wide receiver one. I mean, he's going to boom right off the bat. I think it's going to be tough with, um, you know, A.J. Green still playing on the outside. Um, Marquise Brown there and Zach Ertz. When DeAndre Hopkins does come back in, it's going to be a very crowded offense because I think that uh, Brown is going to really establish himself as the wide receiver one there. Jesse, did you have anything that you wanted to add about Brown? No, I think the difference in in passing efficiency between the two quarterbacks. I love Lamar. I think he's a great a great fantasy quarterback. But Kyler Murray is just a different breed when it comes to throwing the football, man. Um, and I think just being in that system too, where they run a lot of three or four wide receiver sets. I, I don't think that they're. I don't think they have enough mouths to feed when it comes to what they want to do through that air raid style system. And for me, it's it's just. It's kind of a no-brainer. When you look at it from a roster perspective on paper, it looks DeAndre Hopkins coming back after after week six. Um, you have uh, Marquise Brown, Rondell Moore, who I'm I'm pretty high on still. I, I really think that Rondell is going to be – I hope that – listen, it's a manufactured this, – this isn't a Rondell Moore segment. I'm not doing this right now. I'm not doing <laughs> this, Nate. I'm not going to look us. at your face. I'm not going to yeah. do this right now. Um, Marquise Brown is, is, is definitely going to be a 1A, 1B style compliment to DeAndre Hopkins, and I'm, I'm excited to see him in a more pass-heavy offense that doesn't necessarily rely – on one playmaker to make all of the plays in that, in that offense. So I'm excited um, to see that kind of manifest and hopefully Marquise Brown can take that consistent step into, you know, top end wide receiver one kind of contention. 
Yeah, and, and I think he was in a great spot in Baltimore. I mean, it, it yeah. doesn't really get better than that. The one spot he could have gone in the NFL that was an upgrade from Baltimore was Arizona. Right. So you got to be excited about that. Yeah. We've sat here and gassed up the guys that we see as our biggest risers throughout the offseason. Now it's time to talk about the guys who aren't in such a great light, some guys that are sliding a little bit. And Jesse, why don't you start us off? Who was one of your biggest fallers so far since the NFL season has ended? Yeah, so when I when I make these lists of fallers or sell guys that I'm really looking to offload on my rosters, a lot of them are pur- purely situational. And I want to preface this by saying I like to be a year early than a year late with my dynasty rosters. That's the way that I look at it. So even though maybe some of the names you're going to hear come out of my mouth in a few minutes are going to be guys that you're like, wait, this guy, is, he's like new system or new coach or like he was actually pretty good last year. That's fine. That's dandy and all. I'm going with the year early approach and I'm going to offload all of these guys on my roster. And we're going to start off with Josh Jacobs here. Nothing insane. I think he's, he's fine right now. I think he's still locked and loaded for an RB one style role. Um, Josh McDaniels and, you know, coming from his, his Patriots. um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, but coming from his Patriots stint, I guess you could say, um, you know, they use a lot of, of running back by committee style approaches. It's really hard for a running back to get consistent, consistent workload in those offenses. I don't know if he's going to adopt that same thing. So I'm not going to even come out and say that's one of the biggest reasons I'm, I'm off of Josh Jacobs. I'm off of Josh Jacobs right now because in dynasty, I think we're looking at the highest value he's going to have from this point forward. I think that now if we look on Am I allowed? I can reference other websites and stuff, right? Oh, of course. Just, yeah. Okay. Of just, course. Just making there's sure. There's only one rule, Jesse. Yeah. There's <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. There's only one rule. Okay. I'm just making sure. On uh, going back on keep trade cut, Josh Jacobs is he's the RB22, which I probably would say is appropriately valued, but he's coming in slightly under a 2024 first. I am more than willing to smash that accept button right now on Josh Jacobs. And I've actually seen it happen in one of my leagues. Um, I'm more than willing to offload that. He's a young running back. You can pitch that he's still got a lot of good years left, but I am out on him right now before the Raiders did not pick up his fifth year option. They're not going to, he's likely not coming back. And I am going to get out of that on my dynasty rosters right now before he ends up on a team and ends up being the Kareem hunt to a Nick Chubb or, Mm -hmm. you know, like that kind of scenario. Josh Jacobs is a good running back. And for the past three seasons, he has held his own uh, against up into the the upper echelon of of top 12 running backs right now. But I don't think that that's stable. He's not the type of running back that we can predict stability from. He's the one, he's a volume running back, which is a lot of what everyone's saying about Derrick Henry right now and so on and so forth. He's a guy that really thrives with the volume he's getting. I think if you're going to make a case for going ahead and and shipping him off, I think, you know, last year, his reception, um, his his influx of receptions, 54 receptions last year, 348 receiving yards, kept him kind of in the hunt from that 15 point um, fantasy points per game in PPR. So like he, he, he was low on the low end of his career in the NFL and rush attempts and rushing yards as well. Yards per carry, all that stuff. But we saw a really, really big um, jump in his receptions and his receiving yards. I think that's something that could probably stick for him wherever he ends up going after Las Vegas. But for me, it's just a situational thing. The Raiders have told us they do not value him. I am not going to value him. I'm going to send those offers and see if I can get, you know, a 2024 first for him. So purely situational there. I think he's fine for this year. I think he probably has one more year to kind of elevate himself. And maybe, maybe he's still worth that 2024 first when it, when he comes around, but we're looking at him turning into that 25, 26 area by that time. And especially if you're, you're sitting on him on like a rebuilding roster, like he's just not going to do anything for you. Offload him and get the first. If you yeah. And like you said, I mean, every the, the three points I talk about when I talk about Josh Jacobs is that they, they pass on the fifth year option, which you talked about. Josh McDaniels is going to implement a uh, a committee approach. And then with him hitting free agency next year, you know, I, I can sit here and go through all the free agents, Saquon Barkley, Kareem Hunt, Rashad Penny, Kenyon Drake, Jamal Williams, Melvin Gordon. I mean, there are so many good running backs that are hitting free agency next season. And I haven't even talked about the rookie class that's coming yeah. in as well. So there are not going to be a lot of you know open jobs for the taking next year. Um, and, and like you said, he's probably going to end up in a committee role next year. And then last year, we finally saw him get involved in the passing game. That's not going to happen this year. I mean, last year was kind of the perfect situation where he yeah. actually did take on a three down back roll. Now with Zamir White in Las Vegas, Kenny Drake coming back from that injury, likely sometime midseason. You know, he's going to go back to his just early down role. You know, might get a couple touchdowns here and there, but 
realistically, he probably finishes as a mid to back end RB2 this year and then hits free agency and God only knows what happens to him then. So I'm with you. If you got Josh Jacobs shares, try to offload him now because it seems like the floor can just completely fall out after the season. Nate, any anything on Josh Jacobs? Anything you wanted to add here, Nate? I'm not I'm not even sure what you add to Josh Jacobs. I wasn't really a fan of Jacobs coming into the league. Um, he has exceeded expectation, to be quite honest with you, because mm -hmm. I thought it was a weird first round pick when he was selected, anyways. But as noted, when they didn't pick up the, the fifth year option, that was a big deal. And I think it's a great point that Jesse had made about sort of that Kareem Hunt tandem running back scenario that could be in his future where yeah, he might still have value, and he's only averaging, what, 15 fantasy points per game right now. So maybe in the future, he averages 11 and a half, 12, 13. It's a small fall off from where he is, but he's not the perceived guy in the offense. And that's where the value in Dynasty falls off. His production may drop, you know, let's say three to five fantasy points, which is a hit, but his Dynasty value is going to crater a ton. And that's really where you're going to feel it. Yep, completely with you. Let's move on to the next one, Nate. Who is a guy you want to talk about that you've got sliding a little bit in your dynasty rankings this offseason? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, look, I'm old enough to remember Travis Fulgham, so I'm young enough to remember <laughs> Amon Ross St. Brown. It. This is the way that the end of last season... Now, look, a lot of fantasy analysts that I love out in the space, not going to name names, were touting heavily Amon Ross St. Brown's potential and what he was going to be, and I watched his value amidst this crazy... You know, six game stretch rise to around the wide receiver 19 in Dynasty, which to me Unreal. was absolutely bananas. And bananas was a word that I substituted in. Now, <laughs> when I look at Amon Ross St. Brown, Detroit last year, they trailed on 64% of their plays. Okay, this is a team that was constantly trailing. So they were obviously throwing the ball more frequently than most teams. This is part of the reason I love DeAndre Swift because. He was one of the only options in the passing game the team had to throw. So he was targeted, but this, okay, so there was 64% trail rate, razor thin depth chart. And this is how you get to St. Brown seeing 119 targets. When you go last year and look back at the, the wide receiver one, two, and three in Detroit based on targets, here's how it broke down. Amon Ross St. Brown, Khalif Raymond, Josh Reynolds. Okay, if the last two names that I said don't, wake you up and go, oh, okay, it makes sense why he had this immense opportunity, then there's not much I can do for you. But when I look at the team next year, this offensive line should be one of the better ones in the league. This defense should be better than it was last year. And I thought they were very competitive last year in a lot of very difficult games with Dan Campbell. TJ Hawkinson missed five games last year. He's going to be back and healthy this year. They add DJ Chark. When, when Jamison Williams is healthy, he's going to be a huge threat. This was a team that already targeted the running back position in the top six in the NFL at a 23.3% rate. I just don't see a scenario where with a healthy team, Amon Ross St. Brown returns anywhere close to the value that people are hoping for. Yep. And again, we're in lockstep on this one. The first article I wrote this offseason was pump the brakes on the Amon Ross St. Brown hype train. I mean, it just and, and that was before the draft and before free agency. And in this article, I specifically said they're going to go out and get DJ Chark. And I said, they've got two first round picks. They're going to use one of those first round picks on a receiver. And that's exactly what happened. And, and I got the splits here, which I'm sure you're already aware of. But it was uh, week 13. That's when DJ uh, or TJ Hawkinson got hurt. Yep. And then DeAndre Swift got hurt as well. DeAndre Swift did come back at the end of the season, but he played a very limited role, wasn't himself. And and, and the splits are just unbelievable. Um, target share, weeks 1 through 12, 14.5%, which is nothing to write home about. Weeks 13 through 18, 32% target share. I mean, that is more than Cooper Cup had over the season last year. On, that is not on. something that's predictable. And then uh, Andrew Cooper, a good friend of mine, we were on a show earlier this week, and, and he dropped this nugget on me. The best fourth round rookie as far as fantasy production goes, the, or not fourth round rookie, just the best fourth round receiver over the last 20 seasons. I'll give you guys each one guess. Who do you think it was? Most points throughout his career. Most points throughout his career, fourth round wide receiver. You're not going to get it. Get it. So let me just throw it out there. Cecil Unbelievable. Short. Cecil just Cecil didn't even Short. get a chance. I didn't even get a swing at it. I was yeah, going to no, say I, Cecil I, Short. Well, I wasn't going to get that anyway. So. So, I mean, that's what we're looking at here. It's like his best case yeah. scenario is he's Cecil Shorts. Realistically, he probably gets faded into oblivion after this season. And, that's, you know, people think that Jameson Williams is going to help open the field up for him, that he's a deep threat. And, and, and that's just not the case. I mean, Jameson Williams wins everywhere on the field. He is a bona fide alpha. Um, I mean, there's a very realistic chance that with DJ Chark, um, Jameson Williams, 
DeAndre Swift and TJ Hawkinson, Amandre St. Brown could realistically be fifth in targets. Maybe not this season because of Jamison Williams' injury, but going into you know the 2023 season, he's probably fifth in the pecking order on a run first team run by Jared Goff. That's not anything I want any part of. So again, I mean, we we, we just keep agreeing. This is going to be a really boring show for the viewers. <laughs> I would I scouted all the stuff you wrote in the off season, so the next ones will all just be things you wrote also. So well, maybe Love it. maybe they'll be happy to learn that I'm just winging it off the cuff right now. So if everyone <laughs> agrees with me, I'm I'm just I'm doing great. So I'll take Let's that. Do it. So I think we're all in agreement on Amonra St. Brown. Unless Jesse, you got something to say? Like, are you out going out and buying Amonra right now? No, but I am a little bit skeptical. So, I, I mean, it's like we can look at the sample size from when TJ Hawkinson did go down to, you know, the way that, that Amon Ross St. Brown did finish the season. One one thing that I think goes under the radar amongst just football football minds in general is there is a genie out of the bottle sort of effect when these things happen it happens all the time with running backs i mean elijah mitchell is is a, the latest one that i really think is is probably a prime example of that i'm interested to see how they view the setup once jameson williams comes back between amon ross st brown tj hawkinson and jameson williams we know jameson williams is that electric playmaker downfield threat and amon ross st brown is electric in his own right but for me I'm always going to lean with the data. I'm always going to lean with the fact that he was a fourth round wide receiver and teams invest in, in, in players early that they really, really want to invest in. That's going to be Jamison Williams, but there is an effect of the genie has been led out of the bottle with Amon Ross St. Brown. And I think that there's something to be said for the front office, looking at him, at him and being like, this guy can be a difference maker in our offense. I would not be surprised if come 2022 and beyond, they manufacture touches for him. They manufactured that those, those targets for him. That's the way that I look at it. That's the way, you know, I'm, I'm with you, Nate. I'm not saying he's, I'm not, I'm not know. buying him. I'm not buying him, but I am saying that there is he's a legitimate case. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I am Nate, Nate. I Nate. feel like you're trying to turn a small battleship in a tiny bay right now. This doesn't, <laughs> I'm not, we're not in lockstep anymore, actually. We're, we're not. Um, I think that and, one you know, of the big props differences. Props to Jesse for throwing it out there. I'm no. just, I'm just saying. Listen, you've I'm got, just saying. Look, you do. You've got, you've got big you know, family yeah. show, right? Cajones. Yeah. I think we Cajones, can say that. Exactly. Yeah. Basketball. There we go. Listen, I, there we go. I think one of the big differences, I agree with the genie out of the bottle. When teams finally go, oh crap, we hit. This yeah. guy's actually good. Tyree that Hill. is an effect. But I think we've seen it time and time again. When you say the word data, what you're essentially saying is allegiance to the draft capital. Teams that draft guys late rarely give them opportunities. When, when they put a first round pick in on Jamison Williams, like he's getting opportunity. He Absolutely. will be on the field. The one thing I will say about Amon Ross St. Brown, so now you're forcing me to be complimentary, by the way, which I yeah, don't do like. it. Do the it. One, the one nice thing, I'm going to do it because I wanted to not. Be about it, reason, Nate. Be I'm about, not really it. about it. Stop yelling at me. The one <laughs> thing that I have to say is that his snap share out of the slot could be one of the big advantages and one of the reasons that we see him still sort of survive in this offense if you will i think we might see some occasional production out of him some games that are fantasy viable but again i'm just i'm just not in on this guy whatsoever um for all the reasons that i mentioned even despite the fact that jesse just tried to convince me and, and i think the I'm, biggest thing is like if the team trusted amon or st brown they wouldn't have signed dj chark they wouldn't have traded up in the first round for jameson williams i think those two you know signings the the additions are pretty indicative of how the team feels about Amonra St. Brown. They going absolutely forward. matter. They add those signings absolutely matter. I'm I'm just I'm just saying there is a level of and I know I I don't use there are outliers. There are guys there are the Julian Edelmans of the world that are drafted late and the they literally shorts. they are there there are dude I'm telling you right now there are guys like that that once they flash teams, they they they're like, okay, this guy can be a difference maker. Now, to the counterpoint, your guys' point, there is something to be said for DJ Chark and um and uh Jamison Williams coming on board and TJ Hawkinson still being a factor. I'm just throwing it out there, and that's it. And I, and we appreciate that. We finally got some good discourse here where we aren't all just, you know. Uh, kumbaya and telling each other how great each other's takes are so i'm glad we got to have that little discussion there but you know let, let's go ahead we're running low on time here so let's keep it down to one more faller for each hopefully you guys save the best for last jesse start us off here who is your final faller that you want to talk about here 
Yeah, so this one, I'm coming out of left field because that's what I kind of like to do when I have you know, I make an appearance on these shows and stuff. And I'm sorry if I ruin your guys' parade or whatever, but this is not a player, but this is kind of a faller for me. And this one is going to be spicy. I expect a lot of discourse on this one, okay? 2023 rookie draft picks, okay? Those are my fallers right now. Okay. Yeah, even okay. both of you guys okay. right now. I know everyone wants to go acquire Tell them. Me. They're so, they're going to be they're going to be so incredible right now. If you have a 2023 rookie pick or you have multiple because you're probably smart and you knew that this draft class was going to be great, you're sitting on a literal gold mine right now, especially heading into midseason. This is the time right now where you understand that looking at all of your draft picks in a single year, it does not matter what year it is. It could be 2025, 2026. The only real value that a draft pick has is if it's in the first three picks of any rookie draft. Those are premium picks. Those are the premium ones that everybody wants. And in this upcoming 2023 class, people are convincing themselves that there's 12 of them that are going to be worth a 101. I'm sorry to tell you that it's not going to happen, okay? They're going if we're going to enter the 2023 season right now, it is going to be CJ Stroud, it is going to be Bryce Young, and it is going to be maybe JSN, Jackson Smith and Jigba. And that's it. Everyone's convincing themselves that Tyler Johnson, that um that that Bijan Robinson, which I I like Bijan Robinson. I think he's going to be great. I think that there's going to be the, I think he's going to be a great running back. But I'm telling you right now that if you treat these picks the way that the market is treating them, you are more likely to gain a player that is better right now for your team than what you can with that pick in the long run. Okay. That's the way I'm looking at it right now. That's the way that I think everybody should be approaching it. The the 2023 hype of this class is out of control. I don't remember a time that I literally could not trade out of a 101 from one year and not get a, a first a random first at that in the following year, which is essentially what I tried to do this year with the 2022 class to the 2023 class. It's absurd right now. And you're literally sitting on an asset that you can flip for a better commodity right now. That's going to help your team. And if you're really, really smart and you're willing to give up a couple of those 2023 picks, you're going to get an asset. That's going to be a big difference maker now and in the future, if you're a smart dynasty trader. So that's kind of my faller. That's where I'm landing with these 2023 rookie picks sell sell them right now because i and and even maybe you hang on to them till mid-season or right after right after the season they are never they they're the the hype is out of control right now I, i'm gonna say something but i i feel like nate is ready to explode right now so nate, you take the mic oh okay well no look jesse i i think i think you're right and you're wrong i think you're okay. right and you're wrong yes i think you're right in the sense that People are willing to give up proven production this year for these future picks because there's a lot of hype around them. I think where being wrong about it is coming into play is trading them this early. They're not even close to what they will be coming into next year. And the only reason I say this is everybody was taking dumps on the 2022 class. And as soon as those guys tested at the combine, it was like, man, I got to get 2022 picks. And we still aren't necessarily in love with this class. So I agree. And one other thing that I want to say, and I had talked to somebody about this and I actually think it's a great point. We're going to learn more about this in the future with all this new NIL stuff. It's very interesting to see who's going to stay back in college and who's mm -hmm. going to come out mm -hmm. even pre NIL. I remember people waiting for guys like Najee Harris, Travis Etienne, thinking they were going to come out and they went back for an additional year. So those picks you thought you were going to have in the class didn't actually exist in the class that you traded into. So I think there's a lot at play to your point. I think we don't know who gets hurt. We don't know who declares. We don't know really anything about it. So I, it's it's both ways. I can see it both ways. I'm, I'm yeah. with you on the timeline. I'm definitely mm -hmm. with you on the timeline right now. I think that these picks are going to accrue more value as we get deeper in. But you also run the risk right now of getting into that that part of, you know, December and January and February where we learn that there's not going to be 12 guys that are all worthy of those those early picks. I'm of the mindset again, I'm always I'm a year early before I'm a year late and I'm going to gamble on that every single time. If we look at keep trade cut, a 2023 early first right now projected is the 16th highest rated crowdsource commodity. We're talking like Javante Williams and Cooper Cup in between those guys. Javante Williams at 15, Cooper Cup at 17. You mean to tell me that I can swindle? 
I can swindle a Cooper Cup if I if I sway something if I if I if I'm good with my words I can I can just objectively offer a 2023 out there. I'm not saying it gets done, but if that's if I'm literally able to go down the list right now and look at T Higgins well below at 24, AJ Brown at 26, guys like Trevor Lawrence at 27. I mean Debo Samuel 28, Stephon Diggs 29. These are just these are all guys that are literally going to contribute to you winning a championship in 2022. And I will pay a first every single time for that. So Let's from my a perspective, name to it instead of a pick though, are you, are you trading a 21 year old CJ Stroud away for a 30 year old Cooper cup? Because that's eventually what yeah, it's if it gets is. me a championship. Damn right. I am. No, I will do that every all. single time. Yes, it will. Because hey, you, you don't, back you, this man. you don't know. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't you play inside if you really truly believe that your roster is where you want it to be and you're gunning for a championship i will sell the farm of picks i will sell them all i will sell every last one of them if it means if it means that come week 15 16 17 whenever your championship is then i'm the winner i will sell it every single time cuz guess what guess what i know guess what, what you, i know what do you know, I know that, just say I, it i know that cj stroud is not a sure thing I know that Bryce Young is not a sure thing. I know that I've never seen them take a snap in a professional football league. And, I, and I'm and i more than willing to trade away what I don't know because I have confidence in myself for something that I do want in the future. And if it gets me a championship, I'll gamble on that every single time. Nate. And you could, every we, single could time. we could rewind a year and we could have been having the same conversation saying, do you really want to give away, you know, a, a 23 year old DK Metcalf for a 20 year old Trevor Lawrence and, at the time, it would have sounded crazy, but you know things do happen. Like like you said, no thing is a sure thing. As much as we love CJ Stroud and Bryce Young, you know there 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 is a little bit of inherent risk there. But I, I don't know. Oh, man. there's Cooper a lot Cup. of risk there, but I'm taking it. I'm taking it every time. Jesse, I at least at least you said it with conviction. <laughs> you you won't get anything less out of me. You will I never know, will. Know, we won't. Good, some great conversation here, fellas. I love it, Nate. Go ahead and, uh, and and finish this off here with your final faller. Let's do it, man. So I wanted to say Elijah Mitchell, but I'll save you the trouble. If you go to YouTube, you can see me do my Elijah Mitchell takedown already. I want to do Devin Singletary. I know it's not necessarily the sexiest name, but I see a lot of people on social media that seem to still be all in on Devin Singletary, which to me is a bit shocking because even before Buffalo drafted James Cook, to eat into Devin Singletary's workload, they had already picked up the phone and tried to get J.D. McKissick to come in first to do the exact same thing. And then here we are, the deal falls through. Fast forward to April, boom, they draft James Cook, who, by the way, is infinitely more dynamic than Devin Singletary in literally every single way. Um, for the people, though, that think that mobile quarterbacks are a benefit to the running back position, that might be true, but it's not true for non-athletes. In 2021, Devin Singletary averaged 11.1 rush attempts per game, which was the RB36, 2.9 targets per game, which was the RB29, but he was top 12 in red zone touches with 46, except that was 46 behind Jonathan Taylor and just 14 ahead of his own quarterback. And this is a team that rarely targets the running back position. They were in the bottom seven last year with a 15.4% target rate and on top of all of this he's a free agent at the end of this season i am completely out on devin singletary yeah you know it, it's kind of funny that people are in on devin singletary because like we, we've seen this for years now like buffalo just doesn't produce good running backs and and that's why people are fading james cook now but then they're falling in love with devin singletary and it, what if devin singletary and zach moss just suck and that's why they haven't produced a good running back i mean everybody thinks that devin singletary is going to have this big season he's five foot seven 200 pounds slow doesn't really have much burst, no strength. I mean, he doesn't really do anything well. And then they go out and, like you said, sign a guy who's bigger, more dynamic, does everything better than Devin Singletary. So I'm with you on that one as well. Um, my, my, one of my favorite narratives that I've heard is, well, Devin Singletary is still going to get the goal line work, which just isn't true. Josh Allen's the goal line back. They're not going to give it to a five foot seven Devin Singletary instead of right. Josh Allen. So I'm, he I'm had with you. Five goal line carries last year. Yeah, he had five goal line carries. And what Josh Allen had sixteen or seventeen, something like yep. that. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, well, I, I think we're all in agreement there. I mean, I, I see Jesse nodding as as much I've, as we just I've ripped faded on Jesse's like 2023 three rookie pick. <laughs> <laughs> I've faded Devil Devin Singletary for the past three years. This Smart is man. Dude, so you know. Smart. 
Well, guys, I, you know, I, I think that's it. I think we had a good show here, some good conversation, push back on each other a little bit. Always a good time getting to know some other people in the industry. Before we sign off, though, um, Nate, go ahead and let everyone know where they can find you on uh, social media. I think you got a Discord, too. Go ahead and plug the Discord. Yeah, let people absolutely. know where they can get to know you a little bit better. So, guys, easiest way to find me, just follow the breadcrumbs. Go to social media. Find me on Twitter at an outraged Jew. You did hear that correctly. Go to my bio. You can find links to my Discord, to my YouTube, where I'm dropping weekly videos that I spend an ungodly amount of time editing for no real reason other than I guess I just don't want to see my family more frequently. That's the best place you can find me. Hopefully you got a soundproof studio there where your wife and kids didn't hear that from the other Doors room. Doors wide open. All right. <laughs> we say it openly. We're honest here. Jesse, yeah. let everyone know where they can find you as well and what you got going on. Yeah, man. Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter. That's pretty much where you can find anything that I do is always going to be posted on Twitter at Jesse Reeves FF. Um, and yeah, dude, you guys can find anything that I'm involved with, uh, over at dynastynerds.com. And, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Well, awesome guys. <laughs> Thanks for making the time. I know this is a busy time of year and people aren't talking dynasty. So I appreciate you putting those dynasty hats on, having those conversations. Uh, as always, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page at youtube.com slash football guys. You can find all of my content footballguys.com, And my Twitter is at Dave Kluge, K L U G E. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I will catch you next week. Thank you so much for watching the show. If you look on the right side of your screen, you'll see uh, some other videos that we have on our YouTube channel for you to check out. If you haven't already, be sure to like this video and subscribe at youtube.com slash football guys. You can find this podcast anywhere podcasts can be found. Just search Dave Kluge, the Launchpad, Football Guys, and you will be able to find it. Thank you so much for